Well, good morning, church. It's good to be together with you this this Advent season, working our way through Luke chapter 1 and into the beginning of Luke chapter 2. And and I want to begin our time by by thanking Pastor Ryan last week for his, his faithful, thoughtful, and encouraging exposition. Because the truth of the matter is, I assigned him a monumental task when I gave him that section. It was no small section of scripture to preach in one sitting. But I believed that it was justified because of the twofold contrast that Ryan brought us out of the text. I thought it was important that we see them side to side. We could see Zachariah and we could see Mary right next to each other. See, see, on one hand, there's a glaring contrast between Zechariah and Mary in that where a lifelong priest struggled to believe that God would do something that he had done countless times in the Old Testament, cause barren women to have children in their old age. Where Zechariah struggled to believe that, Mary believed that God would do something that he had never done. Insignificant young Jewish girl who is probably in her teens. Believe that God would do something he had never done to cause a virgin to conceive apart from the normal biological means of conception. But the second contrast is a more subtle contrast. It's contrast between Mary and Elizabeth. On the one hand, Elizabeth had endured decades of cultural and family shame because she couldn't have children. And I know in our day and age, we, 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 struggle, for the, we struggle to connect with that. It's not the same today. We understand people who struggle personally with childbearing, but we don't really grasp it in a, in a societal sense. But in the first century, this was a massive, massive difficulty. And what does Elizabeth do when she discovers that she's pregnant? How does she respond? She responds in celebration. She responds in thankfulness. And she says it's because because God has removed her shame. She's been living a life of shame because of her her childlessness and now God has given her honor in this unexpected birth. Luke 1.25, thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among the people. Notice, not not just my personal sense of sadness and loss at not having children, but he's taken my reproach away among the people. But then we turn to Mary. And we discover that Mary's experience is going to be the exact opposite of Elizabeth. Isn't it? Mary Mary knows this. Women who had babies out of wedlock were not were not loved and supported. No, for those who were not executed, They were forced to endure the equivalent of a living death. They were treated like the dregs of society and the births of their children were not celebrated. There were no baby showers. There were no birthday parties. And even when their children grew into their adult years, they still bore the shame of their birth. See, if anybody should have had deep-seated concerns or questions about Gabriel's announcement, it should have been Mary. But how does Mary respond? We see that she humbly submits to every single loss and hardship that she might encounter on the path of obedience. Luke 138, behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be done to me according to your word. She doesn't ask for guarantees. She submits. Yet as we read these humble, faith-filled words, 
What's missing? What's missing in the moment? They, they don't contain a single word of joy or celebration or delight. Not, not even a hint. And in this, we're able to see that even though Mary, Mary grasps the content of Gabriel's message, it appears like she's struggling with the personal implications of the message. Yes, she's surrendering to God's plan wholeheartedly. But at the moment, it's with a faith with questions. It's, it's a semi comprehending surrender to God's plan for her life. But in this we see, in this passage we see, that that God does not leave Mary to process the ramifications of his message in solitary isolation. God, God doesn't just leave her with Gabriel's announcement. No, Gabriel gives her message. Your, 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 your relative Elizabeth is having a child. She's old. She's been barren. She shouldn't be having kids, but by God's grace, she is having a child. And so what does Mary do? Mary heads off on a trip to visit her cousin or her relative Elizabeth. So if you're taking notes this morning, we're we're simply dividing this passage into two pieces. Elizabeth's revelation, verses 39 through 45. Mary's response, verse 46 through 56. And then we're gonna conclude with with three implications for Christians today. So let's go to verse 39. In those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. Let's, let's, just pause, let's just pause on this for a minute before, before we run on from here because, because there's some things we need to see about Mary in the moment. Mary does not schedule a, a visit with her fiancé Joseph. Nor, nor does she stand around waiting for, for another angelic appearance. She responds, how? In haste in haste, to the surprising news that her childless relative is about six months pregnant. And we see at least three things about Mary in this. Number one, given that she's made haste to visit Elizabeth, it helps us to see that, that, that she really believes the angel's message. She doesn't wait for a birth announcement. She doesn't wait for news to come by messenger or homing pigeon or however else they emailed in those days. No. No. She immediately sets out on a three to four day journey that's covering 80 to 100 miles to visit Elizabeth in person. Number two, this hasty journey helps us see also that that, that Mary doesn't have any contact with Joseph for roughly six months because at the end of our passage, it tells us after six months, she left after the birth of John the Baptist. And by that time, when she got home, what would we know about Mary when she arrives? She's clearly and undeniably pregnant, something she was not when she left in haste. Number three, given that Mary leaves in haste and and the way that, that Luke tells the story, Mary's leaving so fast, it's most likely she does not even know that she's pregnant yet. Here's Angel's message, leaves in haste, go visits Elizabeth. After all, Gabriel told her how it was going to happen, not when it was going to happen. So let's turn to verse 40. And when she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth, and when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, and why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy, and blessed 
Blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Now, now just look at the chain of events here. Elizabeth does not say a single word about her, her pregnancy. Rather, she erupts into passionate, joy-filled celebration at Mary's arrival the moment Mary says hello when she walks in the door. But why? I mean, I have no doubt that Elizabeth had all sorts of things. She was waiting to tell Mary about her excitement and about the baby and how long things have been, what happened with Zechariah, but none of that comes out of her mouth when she walks in the door. Something unexpected happens. According to Luke, she breaks out because the Holy Spirit is actively working in her son John, who who Gabriel said would have the Holy Spirit from in his mother's womb. And he breaks out in celebration. He breaks out in celebration. It's just it's just amazing. From, from the moment that Mary walks in the door, everything changes on the, on the one hand. Elizabeth's unborn son, John, recognizes something that nobody else can see. It's that the embryonic Jesus is in his presence in Mary's womb. And he responds the only way he can as a baby. Physical rejoicing. He can't speak anything but he is leaping and jumping for joy. The second thing we see here is that Elizabeth is instantly filled with the Holy Spirit so that she can declare the glorious truths that her unborn son is celebrating. Because apart from the interpretation, where it's, it's like, how do you interpret this kid all of a sudden going crazy? Yet it's important at this point to point out that in all this celebration and in and, and, and all this blessing, Elizabeth, she's not, she's not worshiping Mary. She's celebrating three things. Three things about Mary. First and foremost, she's celebrating the Holy Spirit's revelation that God's work in Mary's pregnancy is exceedingly superior to his work in her pregnancy. And again, given the cultural ramifications of an older woman having a surprising birth and a young girl who's who's betrothed to be married but not married and is is pregnant, that is completely upside down. And here's the reason why. Whereas whereas Elizabeth is giving birth to the long-promised prophet, Mary is blessed above all other women because she's giving birth to the long-awaited Messiah as the angel Gabriel foretold. That's why Mary's blessed above all other women. Secondly, when she celebrates Mary, she refers to Jesus as my Lord, and when she does, she is most likely pointing us to the fact that Jesus is so much more than just another child. That this child is God in human flesh. And number three, she celebrates something that nobody could know but God himself. The humble, profound, authenticity of Mary's faith. Nobody can know this but God. Verse 45, and blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. The revelation, Mary, you are pregnant. Not only are you, but you believed. You believed that what God said would happen, and it's happened. And remember, as we, as we said earlier, it's most likely that when Mary walks to the door that she is not bubbling over with joy and happiness and a sense of personal blessing when she walks through the door. 
She's believed in God. She's willing, willingly submitted to his plan for, for her life. But for everything that we've seen in, there's a, in the text, there's a good chance that she's been struggling on this trip with fear and grief and worry over the personal and social cost of what this pregnancy is going to entail. Up until this moment, she hasn't uttered a single word of praise. Yet in this moment of supernatural revelation and celebration, something glorious happens. For Mary, something happens. Everything comes together. Instead of Mary being in this place of of semi-comprehending submission, Mary sees it, Mary gets it, the, the, the light bulb turns on. And in a moment of joyful clarity and heartfelt release, what does she do? She practically explodes in a song of spontaneous praise and worship. This is quite a different response than we see after the angel's message. So let's turn to it. Verse 46, Mary's response. And Mary said... My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior for he has looked down on the humble estate of his servant for behold, from now on all all generations will call me blessed for he who is mighty has done great things for me and holy is his name and his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring, forever. You wouldn't know how much is jammed in these verses until you took some time to read. We could honestly spend three weeks combing through this song. Theologians point to the fact that Mary, Mary's song is an intricately constructed mosaic of, of quotes and allusions from all over the Old Testament. Genesis, Deuteronomy, 1 and 2 Samuel, Job, Psalms, Isaiah, Micah, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah. She's she's grabbed truths from all over God's word and brought them into this song and most notably in its pattern. If you read Hannah's prayer in 1 Samuel chapter 2 or her song after Samuel is born. Oh, wait a minute. That was another woman who was barren and mistreated and asking for a child. It's very similar to the opening lines of this song. See, see, Mary's grasp of God's word is utterly amazing. But for the sake of our time together, what I want to do is, is I want to break down the structure of this song. Because I think there's, there's some things for us to see in its structure that will help us see and help us savor and help us celebrate the true source of Mary's joy. Because that's what we want. We we don't want an academic paper on all the different verses. We could learn a lot in them. We want to see the God that she's seen and celebrate him and know him. So as we look at this passage, we could break it down into either two or three pieces. Scholars have conversations going back and forth on that. I'm going to break it down this morning into two key pieces. Verses 46... Through 49, we see, we see this celebration of, of God's undeserved kindness to Mary, and then we see this, this celebration of God's character and commitment to Israel in the following verses. So, so it begins with a focus on Mary, but then quickly the spotlight moves from Mary to the character and nature of God himself. 
So let's turn, let's turn to this first piece, the celebration of God's undeserved kindness to Mary, and let's, let's just read it again. Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he's looked down on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. The first thing I want to point out in this text is that the opening two lines of this song are, are, are in parallel to each other. It's, it's a form of Hebrew poetry. Parallel means, means, means they're not saying one thing and then another thing. They're both, they're both saying the same thing just in different ways. So you see, Mary's not saying my soul is doing one thing and my spirit is doing another. Rather, she's saying the entirety of my inner world is, is captivated by the glorious character and nature and the infinite worth of God. And I want everyone to see it so that they are captivated by it too. Like at this moment, like everything in her life is exploding and it is because of who God is and what God has done. This word magnify here. It's a rather simple word on one hand. It simply just means to enlarge. And if you've been with us for any length of time, you know that we talk about it when it arises because it's important. Because we can enlarge things two different ways, can't we? And, 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 and not all enlarging is equal. You grab a microscope. And you grab it because there's something that you cannot see with your naked eye. And you want to understand more about it. And so you grab it, and you put it on a slide, and you put it underneath there, and you focus it all in, and you can now see something that you could not see before. But it's infinitesimally small, minute, and you wouldn't even know it existed apart from microscope. So we can take something that is incredibly small and try to make it big, much bigger than it really is so that we can actually see it. Now there's another kind of magnification, isn't there? We do a telescope. I mean, we, we have those giant telescopes on the top of mountain peaks. We have, we have telescopes that we put out in outer space. And the purpose of their magnification is not to make small things much larger than they are but actually to help us see incredibly large and glorious and beautiful things for what they really are when all we really see is a speck of light in the night sky. And we can't even differentiate the difference between them. Star, planet, I don't know, something out there, it's twinkling, right? You know, and if you live in a place where there's lots of light, you can't even see them. And there are planets that make Earth look infinitesimally small. And the farther we press out into the universe, what do we see? More glorious and more beautiful and more magnificent and incredibly large things that make our universe and this place that we live look insignificant and small. We gasp when we see some of these pictures come in. I never thought I never thought that could exist. That's what's out there in the blackness. See, by analogy, this is what it means for Mary to magnify the Lord and rejoice in God, her Savior. This song is not a microscope, it's a telescope. telescope to help us see God for who he truly is. To bring him into focus because all too often in our, our daily life he becomes small and insignificant and sometimes so obscured by everything else that's going on it's like he's not even there. She pulls him right into view. She's doing it not just because she's excited. 
songs aren't just for the person. They're to call other people in to see the very same thing. She does this because she wants everybody else to see what she sees, to grasp what she grasps, and to overflow with the joy that she now has. That's what this song is about. And and even though our, our experience isn't the same as her experience, we can have the same kind of joy that Mary has in God. So back to the text. What's the initial grounds of her praise? What's the fundamental reason for her praising? It's that God has chosen to use an insignificant nobody to bear the promised Messiah. Mary's openly declaring, I don't deserve this. I don't deserve this. On the one hand, yes, people from every generation will call me blessed. They'll call me favored by God because she had the privilege of bearing the Christ child, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. In that, we can totally say that Mary's blessed. But on the other hand, she wants every generation to know I'm no one special. I I didn't do anything to earn this privilege. I'm not royalty, my, 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 my family isn't wealthy, it's not prosperous. I'm not connected to circles of, of, of the rich and famous. I don't have a single claim to fame or prestige. I'm simply a recipient of God's undeserved grace and mercy. That's who I am. Everybody's gonna call me blessed, but I have no reason why I should be. See, Mary's, Mary's helping us see, even in this, her humility, grasping where she stands in relationship to God. But, but she doesn't stop here. She could simply have s- celebrated what God did for her in her life. But now, now she wants to go on because she wants us to see past the event in her life. She wants us to see and understand the kind of God who does this. Verse 50 through 55, and his mercy, God's mercy, is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He's scattered the proud in their thoughts of their hearts. He's brought down the mighty from their thrones. He's exalted those of humble estate. He's filled the hungry with good things and the rich he sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. Notice, what does Mary want us to see about God in the second section? She wants us to see that her experience of unexpected grace and privilege is it's actually a manifestation of how God has always worked. It's how God has always worked in the world and how God will continue to work through his promised Messiah. This is how God always works, she's saying. On the one hand, we look at these these past tense verbs in this section, and they do point us backwards in history to monumental acts of God. Most specifically, I think, in Mary's mind here is, is the Exodus, because her use of God's mighty arm is a way in which the Old Testament talks about God's work in his deliverance of Israel from Egypt. And what did God do in that? God humbled the greatest superpower on the planet. A a, a, a people that had been the unmatched power for hundreds of years, untouched. Humbled them. Delivered this slave people from under them. Not only did God deliver them 
So you see, God could have delivered them, taken them to other, another place where they simply weren't slaves and they could live happy lives. But God did not just do that, no. God made them a nation. He gave them land. God humbled the proud and he exalted the humble. But on the other hand, theologians point us to the fact that Mary is also speaking prophetically about the future. She's looking at the future ministry of Christ. As Philip Ryken puts it in his commentary on Luke, Mary, Mary can get away with speaking in the past tense in these verses when, when, when speaking about the future. Because when God said that he's doing something, it's as good as already done. God's promises always come with a guarantee of his fulfillment. Let that sink in. Most of us hear promises all the time and, and we're just hoping that like one or two of them are good and they're going to actually be promises that are fulfilled. I mean, especially it's from, if it's from politicians. Right? But she's saying, man, when we hear from God, it's as good as done. It's going to happen. And if you read through the book of Luke, this Advent season, you will, you, will, you will see this exalting and humbling theme lived out time and time again in the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. Luke, Luke raises this clearly to the surface. It's something that he wants to highlight. Luke, Luke 16. We, we see the self-reliant rich man goes to hell while the God-fearing poor man is call, carried home to be with the people of God. Luke 18, the prayers of the self-righteous Pharisee are denied and the sinful tax collector who acknowledges his desperate need for forgiveness and grace goes home justified. When we get to the very end of the book and the greatest reversal comes when, when God the Son who humbled himself to become man and die on the cross as a substitute for the sins of mankind on the shameful cross, what happens as a result of that humility and shame? He's exalted in resurrection. He's exalted. He's raised to the right hand of God. See, Christian, this is the very way that God operates in the world. The humble are shown mercy while the proud receive justice. The lowly are lifted and the lofty are brought low. That is how God works. But we can't stop there. Because there's a key in this context that we have to realize. Because if we just stop there, we can look all over the world and say, no, that is not the case. I constantly see people who are prideful and arrogant and leadership crushing the lowly. And I see the lowly never making their way forward. How come it's not happening? How come God isn't doing it? Well, the kind of humility that Mary is talking about here is not simply a life of poverty or self-abasement. No. She's talking about a life in which we constantly turn to God in humble, dependent faith for everything we need. That's the humble and the lowly person in this text. We, we see it. Verse 50. Who, who is God's mercy for? His mercy is for those who fear him. Those, those who turn to him and fear him is not like, oh, I'm afraid of God, I'm going to go run away. It's saying, it's saying, there is no one like God. It's commitment and it's trust, but at the same time, that we can talk about a component of fear, of not wanting to be in a wrong relationship with this God. This fear is turning to him for everything that we need. 
And where does God's mercy go? It goes to those who are turning to him humbly and looking to him, not looking to themselves and their self-sufficiency and their answers in life. They're saying, I need you, God. I need you, I need you, I need you. Even if you think about the sacrificial system in the Old Testament, what's it doing? It's saying, I need you. I've blown it again. I need you. Not I'm earning my way to you through dead animals. And how has God shown this character and this mercy most clearly in human history? It's not in the blessing of Mary specifically. It's in the fulfillment of his ancient promise to bless all the families of the earth through the insignificant and lowly line of Abraham. A man who was married with a barren wife. An an insignificant nobody that God turned into a nation. But in making them into, making him into the nation, there's more than a promise of offspring. There's more than a promise of land and nationhood. There's a promise of blessing, and it's not just blessing for Abraham. Genesis 22, starting in verse 17, God says, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven, as the sands that are on the seashore, and your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your offspring, and that's key here, this is in the singular, not plural, in your singular offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you've obeyed my voice. Notice the blessing of Abraham is not a blessing that is reserved for the nation of Israel alone. In, at the very beginning, it's a blessing that God is going to use Abraham to accomplish something far greater. He's going to bring blessing to the entire world. Every tribe, every nation, every tongue. Friends, this is the prophecy that Mary Mary has in mind in these final two verses. She sees a big, glorious, faithful God. She's fully aware that she is not the blessing, but the blessed means through which God was choosing to bless all the families on the earth through the long-promised offspring of Abraham himself. Notice she goes past David all the way back to Abraham. And in this she wants us to see that God, God is always faithful to fulfill his promise and that he's forever loyal to those who belong to him. See the main idea I believe in our passage this morning is this. God is worthy of our trust and he's worthy of our worship because he he fulfills his every promise and he loves to lift the lowly who humbly trust in him for their every need. That's what Mary is celebrating. And she's saying, join me and celebrate this. This is who God is and it's what he does. So it leads us to the question, how? How? How do, we, how do we apply this passage to everyday life? It's one, it's one thing to look back and say, yep, that's, that, that's what Mary's trying to say. Check. We understand the text, but we can't stop at just understanding it. We, we, want to, we need to apply it. So I, I'd like to highlight three implications that flow from this text. I'd like to talk about the true nature of faith, the true nature of Christian worship, and the true nature of the gospel, and no, we will not spend another 40 minutes. Speaking of faith, the longest section is here. Three things under this first header. First thing I want you to see out of this is that faith is not an arbitrary act or a blind leap of faith. 
Faith is not a blind leap into the unknown abyss. No, on the one hand, both Zachariah and Mary received undeniable messages from God through the angel Gabriel. They had supernatural revelation, and on top of that, they have the entire Old Testament telling them who this God is. Zechariah knows more. Mary has certainly been too expo- exposed to it. Yet one believes and the other one doesn't. The second thing we see in this passage, it helps us see what does faith do? It looks to the impeccable faithfulness of God, not the innumerable difficulties that challenge his promises. God is impeccably faithful. As we look around us and we wonder how it's going to work out and what God is going to do, yes, there are innumerable difficulties. And we see this most clearly in Mary's song. Notice, she she doesn't believe because she has empirical evidence in the present. No, her song helps us see that she believes God's present faithfulness on the empirical evidence of his faithfulness past. It's interesting, for for all of the interaction with an angel that she had in the previous text, that this song doesn't celebrate angelic announcements and supernatural visions. It celebrates those things that are clearly revealed in God's word. She believes God will do what he said because he's promised to do it and he always fulfills his promises. That's important for us to see. See, 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 while knowledge about God is absolutely necessary for a person to place their faith in God, for, for a person to come to faith in the gospel, they can't, they can't do it in a, a vacuum. They need to hear the gospel message. They need truth proclaimed. They need people to speak the truth in love, to share, to work through questions. Truth is so important. But knowledge about God in and of itself is not faith in God. Is it? You can have tons of knowledge about God. Zechariah had tons of knowledge about God. He didn't believe. See, knowledge cannot function as a substitute for faith. Rather, what does faith do? It treasures and embraces this knowledge about God as the very grounds for its trust about the future promises of God. That's what faith does. I recognize in this God a faithful God who does what he says and I trust he's going to continue doing it. Therefore, I put my trust in him. Do I see it now? No. The third thing we see about faith in this passage, and I think this is really important for Christians to hear, is that true God-glorifying faith can and often does coexist with real questions and real concerns. We have faith, and we can trust God, but we can still be wondering how things are working out in our life. Things aren't making sense. We, we have faith with questions. And we, and we see this in Mary, right? She believes, she freely embraces Gabriel's message because she knows that God will always fulfill his promises. But her faith does not overflow in that joy right away, does it? It doesn't. There's a gap between her, whole, her, her, her wholehearted trust and her joyful celebration of God's promise. And the truth of the matter is, Christian, that we struggle with the same thing. We say, face the very same challenges. But here's the encouraging news from this passage. God commends Mary's faith, but he does not condemn her for her internal struggles or her delayed joy. 
There's not a word of condemnation. Her joy is delayed. He commends her faith. She believed. See, while we can rightly say that faith is a deep-seated confidence in the trustworthiness of a God who always fulfills his promises, faith is not knowing all the answers. Faith is not banishing every possible concern that we might face in this life. Rather, rather what? The challenges and questions in life are the means that we find out that God actually expands and proves his faithfulness in our life. It's through all those questions that God reveals his faithfulness and his trustworthiness and his power. So turning to the second implication that I want to raise. Christian worship. What is the the true fuel of Christian worship? And, And I raise this because much of the worship conversation in our generation, and especially in America, is focused on an individual person's experience and personal preferences instead of God himself. Experience, preferences. In fact, in fact, in many solid churches, we've come to believe the trope that the music has to move us if we are truly going to worship. And let me say, I love music. I love lots of different kinds of music. For those of you who've been to my house and seen my LP collection, you know I have a broad taste in music. And I like it loud. Ask Colleen. But when it comes to worship, What do we see in this account? We see a consistent pattern of worship that actually flows from the opening pages of the Bible until the concluding chapters of Revelation. That there's a a pattern in worship, and and I'm just going to touch on it. We'll come back some other time to really press into it farther. And the pattern is this. It's, It's revelation and response. God reveals himself, whether that's, whether that's through something that is supernatural or he reveals himself through his word, but it's truths about God and there's something that happens inside of the worshiper. It's a response to the truth revealed or to the truth proclaimed and there's a response of joy and delight in worship. Read carefully through your Bible. We see this pattern played out time and time and time again. In fact, that's why I used these two terms in our outline today, revelation and response. See, when Mary arrives at Elizabeth's home, she's walking in faith, but she's wrestling with the real life implications of Gabriel's visit. She's not bubbling over with, with joy. But what, what? It all changes when she walks in the door and Elizabeth reveals the truth about God's work in Mary's life. And, and, and Mary, Mary hasn't got them integrated. She hasn't got them put together. But in this moment of revelation is actually what causes Mary to overflow in joy and, and delight in God. See, Mary seems to know this child is the long-promised Messiah. I mean, after all, Gabriel told her. But what did she miss? What has she, what has she actually missed? Why is there not this overflowing joy here? She's missed the stunning privilege it was to be the mother of the Messiah. Hannah, not Hannah, Elizabeth, three times, calls Mary blessed. Three times. You think by the power of the Holy Spirit, God is trying to get a message to Mary? Mary, you're blessed. You're you're blessed. And it seems to be there's this link between God's faithfulness and and her privilege, 
that causes her to overflow in heartfelt praise. It's that, it's that link. And this could be a sermon in itself, but just, just think about it. Let's bring this to us for a minute. Every single Sunday, we come into church and we're, we're, we're all at different places in our life and we come believing, but we often come believing with questions and difficulties and concerns and we're not necessarily overflowing with joy. We're here, we're present. And when this happens, what do you not need? You don't need somebody up here trying to manipulate your, your emotions. You don't need somebody up here trying to distract you with happy, fun music. We don't need our own version of everything is awesome. What do you need? You need a fresh revelation. And I'm not speaking of this, this supernatural, angelic revelation, but a, a clear proclamation, a revelation of two things. Number one, the faithfulness of your never failing God and your privileged status in Jesus Christ. Those are the things that when they come together, they erupt in a heart that bring up worship and joy. We can grasp a God who always fulfills his promises and sometimes it doesn't move us. But what, what, what brings it together often is, is that understanding that Mary was lacking, the privilege. And some of us don't grasp the privilege of what it means to be in Christ. We don't, we don't grasp the privilege of, of our justification, of our adoption. We don't, we don't grasp the, the, the privilege of our regeneration. But when we do, they have a deep-seated impact on our heart that causes us to overflow in joy. See, these are the only two things that will produce the kind of deep-seated joy that we see in Mary's response. Finally, in this passage, we also see the true nature of the gospel. to put it most simply. The message of the gospel is not that God shows his favor to the good and that he scatters the bad. No, no, if we tried to take a literalistic approach to this passage and ignored the other aspects of who God is and how God works, that's, that's what we might try to say, but that's wrong. And it's not the celebration that the good people get into God's kingdom and that the bad people don't get into God's kingdom. Kind of like some twisted version of Christmas and Santa Claus. You know, Santa just gives good things to good people. But that's not, that's not what we see, right? What do we see in the gospel? What do we see in this passage that helps us grasp the gospel? Is that the good news, is is the gospel is the good news that God loves to lift up lowly, hell-bound sinners who who humbly acknowledge their desperate need for Jesus. That's what we see about the gospel in this proclamation from Mary this morning. If it's something that you have not received and you have not understood, I would love to spend some time with you sharing. Please, talk to me after the service. Set up an appointment. There's no greater thing I'd love to share with you than this. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, this morning, we just, we just thank you for the testimony to your your truthfulness and your faithfulness. We thank you for being able to see ourselves even in Mary's response. We, we confess that we, we, we don't grasp our privilege. We don't dwell on the privilege that we have in Christ. And so often we also, at the same time, fail to hold tight to your faithfulness. Forgive us for this. 
move in our hearts. Help us see you as you are. That we don't look to environment or music to move us. But the steadfast truths of who you are and who we are in you. In Jesus' name we pray.